So let me try to motivate you by giving a scenario why we are interested in FPGA. So consider a scenario where I want to update my computer. So in 2010, I bought my computer. It came with uh, Microsoft Office version 2010. And in year 2016, Microsoft uh, released Office 2016. I, I want to update my system. So what do I do? I just download my new software and install it. That's it. Now consider a similar scenario where I have to update my hardware. For example, in 2010, my gigabit Ethernet, it supported only one gigabit interface. But in 2016, I want to update it to 10 gigabit Ethernet. Now how do I do it? I have to physically remove the Ethernet card. So when you see here, I buy a new card and install it. So what does it tell you? In the first case, we are upgrading a software and in the second case we are upgrading a hardware and it seems like software is inherently flexible and hardware is not. Now imagine how nice it would have been if you can upgrade your hardware the same way you upgrade the software. There is no need to buy a new hardware physically, remove it from your computer and put a new hardware. Instead the same way you, you install a software, you can install a hardware also. Now this is the grand view of FPGA and currently you cannot do to that extent but you will find out to some extent this is uh, possible. You can upgrade your hardware even after you install your hardware. That's the promise of FPGA. Now why hardware is not flexible? So we have studied in our last semester the IC design course and you have seen the integrated circuit and we mostly use so called the application specific integrated circuit which are specific for a particular application like we have specific chip for Wi-Fi, we have specific chip for Ethernet controller etc. Now the functionality of these chips are built into them at the time of manufacturing itself. So you can think like the functionality is burnt into the silicon inside a factory at the time of manufacturing itself and once they are manufactured you can't change the circuit inside them. So that makes them inflexible. Now maybe one day it may be possible that the transistors and the circuit inside the chip can physically change after manufacturing and research is happening in that direction and we are not yet there. So we need to use some alternative technique to achieve this. That means you should be able to change the circuit inside a chip after manufacturing. And at least in digital domain it is possible now and in analog domain also to some extent it is possible because we have new chips called the field programmable analog arrays also where you can change the analog circuit after manufacturing. Now before finding out how it is done using FPGAs, we will uh, accept some of the pseudo axioms. These are not real axioms but I, I just made them up. So first axiom states that any digital circuit can be built using two types of uh, basic elements, the logic gates and flip-flops and wires to connect them. Now you already know what gates and flip-flops are. I'm not repeating it. We have different kinds of gates called AND or NOT gate etc. And we have different kind of flip-flops also but basically we are interested in so-called the D flip-flop which can store one bit of data at a time. And flip-flops, they are the basic unit of memory. Now wires are pieces of conductors which are used for connecting gates and flip-flops all together. Now, doesn't matter how complex your circuit is, they can be always built using gates and flip-flops as long as they are digital in nature. Now, consider a small digital memory. Now, remember our computer architecture course. So, this is a memory and from the figure you can find the memory has four rows. Each row can store only one bit of data and each row can be accessed by specifying the address of the row. So this row has address 0, this address 1, 2 and 3. This I0 and I1, they are the address bus. So if you place 0, 0 here, you are accessing the first row. If you place 0, 1, you are accessing the second row, so on and so forth. So traditionally, we will put the LS bit of address in I0 and MS bit of uh, address in I1. This O here 
is the data bus. So when you place a particular address here, the data in the corresponding memory location will come through this line, the O line. And again, it is only one bit wide because each memory location is only one bit. Now, suppose I somehow stored this data inside the memory. So at this point, we, we don't care about how we actually stored it. Somehow we stored this data in the memory 0001. And now if you give address as 00, the data in the first location 0 will come out here. And same way, you place the other address 01, data in first location comes out, 10, data in second location, 11, data in the third location. So this is how the memory will operate. Now, if you write the relation between the input, so basically your address bus and the data bus, this is the table you will get. And if you closely examine, you will find this table is exactly the same as the truth table of an AND gate. So in another way, this memory is emulating an AND gate. This memory is equivalent to an AND gate. So these two represents the input to the AND gate. This represents the output of the AND gate. Now you take the same memory and you just change the data inside that. Inside, instead of 0001, you store 0111 and if you follow the similar step you will find out this memory is now emulating an OR gate. So you can find out uh, that same memory can emulate different kind of gates by changing the content of the memory. In fact this memory can emulate any two input gate. Now the second axiom states that an in input to n bit deep memory can emulate any input logic gate. So I forgot to mention last time but you already know if you have two bits address the depth of the memory is 2 to the power of n. Okay. So if you have n input address bus the total depth of the memory is 2 to the power of n and that is what is written here. An n input so there are n address bus so the depth is 2 to the power of n and each location is 1 bit. So the total memory is 2 to the power of n bit and it can emulate any n input logic gate. Now you can extend it and state that any n input memory can emulate any n input boolean function. Now from now onwards this small memory this kind of memory we are going to call them with a special name called lookup table or LUT. Now look at the example here where we can use lookup tables to emulate the gates and build a circuit. So we have an AND gate here, OR gate here and one more AND gate here. Now you replace this AND gate with a LUT with uh, this data, this AND gate with this data and this OR gate with uh, this LUT with this data. So this how, how, how this data comes here, we already found out because they are equivalent to these gates. And again, you can see the input to the gates, they go as the address bus to the memory and output of the gate, they are same as the data bus from this memory and you connect them together. And this circuit emulate this circuit. But remember, you can change the circuit by changing the content of this memory again. Now, digital circuits, again, you already know this, are broadly classified into two. They are combinational circuits and sequential circuit. Combinational circuits, uh, they don't have any memory. You give an input, at the same instance, you get the output. They can remember what happened in the past. Now, combinational circuits are built using only logic gates and sequential circuits they have memory that means uh, they can remember their past also now memory of sequential circuit are usually implemented using flip-flops now flip-flops they change their output only during a, a special control signal called the clock signal only when the clock transition happens the input propagates to the output and again you already know the clocks are practically a continuous square wave. So look at the example of a 2-bit adder here. So here you have a combinational adder 
you have an XOR gate and AND gate. Here you have a sequential adder. So what you do is you just hook up flip flops at the output of the combination circuit and you have a sequential circuit. And if you look at the timing diagram for combination circuit, you give the input, you be here, immediately the sum changes like this. But in sequential circuit, although your inputs are changing here, your output changes only during the clock transition. So in this case, I have taken this e, these are positive edge trigger D flip flop. That means the output is changing only during the positive edge of the clock. And you can see here if the inputs are changing when the clock is not uh, changing or when the clock is steady, they are not propagated to the output. Only when the clock transition happens from low to high, the, the inputs are propagated to the output. Now, in, in, in circuit, you have to build both sequential and combinational. So, how do we do it? So, you have already seen the lookup table last time. What you do is you take a lookup table and you hook up a D flip flop and a 2 to N mux as shown in this figure. Okay, And this particular architecture, one LUT, one D flip flop and one mux, this complete architecture, we call it a CLB or configurable logic block. This is not a standardized term. This term is used by FPGAs produced by Silinx, which is the largest manufacturer of FPGAs. Uh, the main competitor is Intel. They use their own term. They usually call it ALM, Adaptive Logic Module. But doesn't matter. This semester we'll be using Silinx FPGA. So remember the term. SCLB. SCLB will enable you to implement both sequential as well as combination circuit. So, how do they do it? So, look at this case. So, if you if you make the MUX control signal zero, okay, the output of CLB, the overall output which is coming here, is the output coming from the lookup table. So, you give the input here to the lookup table, it may be emulating some gates or circuit. The output comes here, that output is going to the D flip flop as well as to the MUX. But if you make this MUX control zero, the signal coming from the LUT directly goes as the output. So this is actually emulating a combination circuit. Now if you make the control signal one, what happens is the output from the D flip flop goes as the output of the CLB. So input comes here, it goes to the LUT, LUT output comes, LUT output goes to the D flip flop, LUT output directly goes to the MUX, but the control signal is 1. So the output from the flip flop is propagated as the output of the CLB. So in, in a sense, this emulates a sequential circuit. So using CLB, you can build both combinational as well as sequential by controlling this MUX. Now, the content of the lookup table and the control bit used for the MUX, they together we call them as configuration bit. Again, look at the case here. You have to build a four input AND gate. For that, I am going to use a four input lookup table. So you have two to out of four, 16 memory location. And since this is AND gate, every location is zero except the last case where where the address is 1111. So only in that case it is 1. In all other cases it is 0. So this is the condition of the lookup table. Now I want a pure 4 input AND gate which is a combination circuit. So I need to bypass this flip flop. So what you do is you make this control signal 0. So the output of the LUT becomes the output of the CLP. Okay. So these bits together with this bit we call them the configuration bit. Now, at least for Silinx FPGA, the basic building block is a CLP. So you have CLPs here. You have already seen the architecture. You take a bunch of them and arrange them in a two-dimensional mesh. And you place so-called switch boxes here. It's certain SB in between. You'll see their functions mm. next. 
So you put the switch boxes in between and we have an FPGA. Now each CLB here is internally this circuit you have already seen. Okay? So we abstract them and just represent it as a square. Now inside a modern FPGA there are thousands and thousands of such CLB. This is uh, the internals of a real FPGA, the one we'll be using this semester. And each of the green dot that you see here, they represent a CLP. So there are thousands of them actually, okay? Not just four as shown in this figure. This is simplified one. In modern FPGAs, there are thousands of them. And again, modern FPGAs, if you look the architecture of the CLP, they are much more complex, okay? Instead of a single LUT and single flip-flop, the new signings FPGAs they have four LUTs. You can see one, two, three, four LUTs here, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight flip flops. Okay, and associated circuitry uh, to combine them. And each LUT here, they are six input. That means they are 16 bit deep. So 16 bit deep, four lookup tables, and eight D flip flops. And they can be connected together. Okay. That is a practical scenario. Okay, now next. So, as we discussed, a 6 input LUT can implement any 6 input logic function, but practically your circuits are much complex actually. Uh, they may need thousands of input or hundreds of input. So, using one single LUT, you won't be able to implement your entire circuit. You will have to combine multiple LUTs and multiple flip flops to implement your entire circuit. So let's find out how it is actually done. How do you connect uh, LUTs or CLBs together? For that, we'll take this circuit as an example. So here we have two gates and one flip-flop. And remember, uh, I'm taking the example of a uh, two-input LUT. So we need one LUT to implement this AND gate. We need one LUT to implement this XOR gate. And we can use one flip-flop in between. Now, a special structure called programmable interconnect. They are the one which enables interconnection of CLPs. Okay. So the interconnections, they consist of switch boxes, so-called, and several wires, actually. So the wires connect uh, output from CLB with uh, inputs of switch boxes. Similarly, output from switch boxes to the input of CLB. And each switch box, they contain so-called a crossbar array. So first, let's look at crossbar array, then let's build up. So this is a simplified view of a crossbar array. So you can see there are rows and columns of wires, and they are not connected, actually. So there is no connection wherever they are crossing. Okay, So you can think like they are arranged one over the other one. Rows and columns, they are in two different layers. But there is a switch at each junction. Okay. So suppose you want to connect this column with this particular row. What you do is you just close this switch. So they are connected now. Now if you want to connect this column with this column, what you can do is you close this switch. So this column is connected with this row now. And you close this switch also. That means this row is connected with this column. So effectively, this column is connected with this column also. Okay. So any row can be connected with any column using this architecture. That's so that's why we call this is a fully connected crossbar switch. Okay. This is a full crossbar. You can connect any row with any column. Okay. Now let's come back to the FPGA. So previous slide we have already seen what CLBs are, and there are these. Uh, blue boxes sitting in between. They are nothing but the crossbar switches, the one we just saw here. Okay. Now, instead of these physical switches, the switch that that are sitting at each junction, they are built using transistor. Okay. So each each junction here has a structure like this, composed of six transistors. You can see. They are called a floating gate transistor. So if you give zero to their gate, these transistors are off. If you give one to their gate, 
the turn on so instead of physically closing the switch what you do is you you apply one to the gate of this transistor the transistor turns on if you want to keep the switch off you apply zero so for example if you want to connect this column with this row what you basically do is see you turn this transistor on key and keep all other transistors off so effectively this column gets connected with this row if you want to connect this column Uh, to continue downwards what you should do is you need to turn this transistor also on so this column continues downwards otherwise what a signal is coming from the top comes from the top and it just goes to right it doesn't go down because this transistor is off okay so this is how FPGAs are uh, built you take thousands or millions of CLBs and you take millions of switch bars switch boxes and just interconnect them like this when you have an FPGA. In addition to that you can also see it's written IO signals or PIN because you can see the CLBs on the periphery of the chip. Okay, on the edge of the chip they are also connected to the to the external pins using special wires like this so that you can give signals from the external world. Okay. Now, uh, in this figure, you can actually see the pins. So, modern FPGAs, they again usually have hundreds and thousands of pins. Actually, usually they are in the form of small balls called the ball grid array, or they are also flat packages, flat grid packages. Now, these pins they are actually connected to the CLBs on the periphery of the chip. Now, from the CLB, then they can be connected to switch boxes and to other CLBs. Okay, now let's come back to our example. This is our overall aim. I have this circuit, very small one. I have this FPGA. My aim is to implement this circuit using this FPGA. And there's an assumption here. Assume each CLB as two input lookup table. Now how do we do it? So the first step that you need to do is you need to map uh, each part of the circuit into CLP. Okay, so this is called a mapping process. Again in IC design also we saw there is a step called map where you have to map the elements to the elements in the standard library and as far as FPGAs are concerned the only standard library component they are CLPs okay so here the aim is how to map the portion of your circuit to each CLP so as I mentioned before uh, we have two gates here and our lookup tables are only two input so of course you will need two lookup tables to do it and there is only one flip-flop so we can use a single flip-flop to do it now this entire portion, this gate and this flip-flop can be mapped to a single CLB because inside a CLB you have a LUT as well as a flip-flop and there exists a connection between them. So what I do is I take a LUT and I need to emulate an AND gate so I store 0, 0, 0, 0001 here. So this emulates an AND gate. Now need to connect to a flip-flop. That connection already exists. The output from the CLB should be the output of the flip-flop. So the MUX control signal I will make it 1 so that the output of the MUX come as the output of the flip-flop. So like this. So this part, this CLB represents this portion of the circuit. Now this part I will map to the second CLB. So what I do is I need an XOR gate. So I need to store 0110 which emulates an XOR gate now the output directly comes from the gate so I need to bypass the flip-flop so what I do is I will make the MUX control signal as 0 so that this flip-flop is bypassed and output from the LUT directly comes as the output of the CLB now again remember all these bits this bit all this bit this bit together they are called the configuration bits okay now this input 1 input 2 input 3 and output they are coming from the external world actually 
so again I assume these two are coming from external world this is the output of this CLV that is going to the next CLV so this output comes as input to this CLV the other one the other input comes from the external world input 3 and the output that goes to the external world through the pins actually okay. So first we did mapping. So we took a circuit, we mapped them to CLB. So next step, again similar to IC design, is placement. You need to find out where these CLBs should be placed. So again remember this this is inside an FPGA, it is pre-manufactured, all CLBs and switch boxes they already exist there. And basically you need to find out which CLBs should be used for implementing uh, these two CLPs. So in a sense this is also a kind of mapping. You need to find out which CLPs inside the FPGA should be used for implementing these two CLP. Now in that case uh, you need to find the input output, the pin constraint or pin location because you already know this CLP it takes two input from external world and this CLP that is also taking one input from the external world so we need to use some CLB where pins are connected. So in a particular case actually it doesn't matter all CLBs are connected to external world but in, in, in a real FPG that is not the case you have thousands of them and only the CLBs on the periphery they have pins the ones in the center they don't have pins so in this case you need to use some CLBs on the periphery. So I am using this CLB CLB0 to, to implement this one this CLB1 and this CLB2 to implement this CLB. Okay, so this guy is this one. So he is taking two input, input one, input two. So this input from the pin they are mapped to input one and input two. And this CLB is mapped here. He takes one input from external world. So this I am mapping to input three from a pin from external world. This I am not mapping because he takes only one input from the external world. The other one comes from the other CLP. Now output. Actually if you want we can map it here actually. Input 1, input 2 and output here. But simply to complicate things I am planning to map this output to the pin connected to this CLP okay just to complicate things so that there should be some way to connect this CLP output to this CLP and get it to the external world okay and this process we call it placement so determining the physical location of each CLP inside an FPGA that's what we call as placement okay and mapping each circuit element to a CLP, that's what we call as mapping the in, 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 in FPGA scenario. So mapping basically means mapping portions of your circuit to CLBs. Placement basically means determining the physical location of, of each CLB inside an FPGA. Okay, so I, I put one CLB here, CLB here you have already seen and here you can see the output of this CLB should go as the input of this CLB. So how do we do it? We need to configure our switch boxes. So I assume this is the output coming from the first CLB and I need to configure this switch box in such a way that this output from this CLB goes as the input to this CLB. So this is the inside of this switch box. So what I do is I turn on this transistor and I turn off all other transistors. So the wire coming from the north directly goes to south because only this transistor is on. So it just goes like this. Now as I said before I wanted to make things complicated so I, I assigned this pin as output. That means the output from this CLB should go to this CLB and finally it should go as output. So what is inside this switch box is given here. What I do is I turn on this transistor and keep everything else off. So the wire coming from the west from the left directly goes to the right. Okay, So it goes like this. 
Now remember, inside the CLB you have a lot of flip flop and a mux. So this wire actually goes as the input to a lookup table. Now what values should be stored in that lookup table so that this input directly goes to this output by bypassing the flip flop that you should find. Okay. Now one important term here is routing. So again uh, in IC design you have seen what is routing that is basically connecting all your transistors together as per the circuit. As far as FPGAs are concerned, routing is basically interconnecting the CLBs by configuring the switch boxes. Okay, that's what we call as routing. Now, so last time uh, we mentioned the term configuration bit, the content of all the lookup table, the configuration bits for the MUX inside CLB, they are called the configuration bit. In addition to that, we have additional configuration bits, they are the bits used for configuring the switch boxes. So all of them together, the content of the LUT, the configuration for the MUX and the configuration bits for the switches inside switch box, all of them together we call configuration bits or we also call them a bit stream and this is the bit stream for our example here so this is what is inside CLB0 these are the content of the lookup table and this is the control bit for the max CLB1 all X basically means they are don't care it doesn't matter what you store inside the CLB it doesn't affect the circuit why because CLB1 is not used for building the circuit CLB2 this is the content CLB3 which is this one here it is question mark you need to find out what is the configuration bit for that CLB3 so that this input directly goes as this output and these are the configuration bits for the switch boxes okay so for each transistor we have six transistors inside so each of them represent uh, for each transistor which of them are on and which of them are off. Now, <coughs> you you make this bit stream somehow and you send this bit stream to an FPGA mm, to implement the particular circuit inside that. So this is usually done using a, a interface called the JTAG interface which is a very popular interface for programming not only SVGs, a lot of microcontroller also we will see in the lab. Uh, it stands for Joint Test Action Group. This is an industry standard serial interface for programming and debugging. Now sending this bit stream to the FPGAs and getting that circuit implemented inside the FPGA we usually call it as programming the FPGA. So, so remember programming the FPGA is totally different from what we usually mean by, by doing our normal programming. Okay, So we usually mean sending this bit stream to the FPGA as FPGA programming. Now there are a couple of questions here. Uh, one question is what restricts the size of the design which we can implement in an FPGA? What restricts? Because FPGAs again they are pre-manufactured chips. They have thousands and millions of LUTs and flip-flops inside. Basically what you are doing is if you want to implement any circuit, okay, you need to map your circuit to these LUTs and flip-flops, MUX and uh, lookup uh, switch boxes. So basically how many elements are present inside the FPGA determine the maximum size of the circuit that you can implement on an FPGA. So you need to build a circuit which requires 200 lookup tables and you have a chip only with 100 lookup table you can't simply do it. You have to take a larger FPGA and implement it there. Okay. Next question whether the size of the bit stream. So bit stream is the entire configuration bits is affected by the size of the circuit. 
designed in that SPGA. So usually it feels like if you have a larger circuit, you will have a larger bit stream, but that is not the case because again remember bit stream contains the configuration bits for all the uh, lookup tables, all the muxes, all the switch boxes. For a given SPGS, the number of LUT flip flop lookup tables, switch boxes, everything remains constant. Okay, so it doesn't matter how large or small your circuit is, the size of the bit stream or size of the file that you use for programming remains constant for a given FPGA. If you take a larger FPGA, you will have a larger bit stream. If you take a smaller FPGA, you will have a smaller FPGA. If you have a LUT of size 4 and if you want to implement a 3 input logic, how to do it? Okay, think about it. How do you do it and find it out? If you want to connect the output of a flip flop to the input of another flip flop, so we don't have this case here. Here, the output of one flip flop is directly going to a gate which can be implemented as a LUT, so life is easier. But here, the question is you have two flip flop connected back to back. Okay, you have two flip flop back to back. That means again, you will have to use two CLBs because you need two flip flop. The question is how can you bypass this LUT or, or, or what values should be stored in this lookup table so that the output coming from this flip-flop gets directly connected to the input of this flip-flop. Okay, Again, think about it. What values you should store here so that if the output from this flip-flop is 1, the input to this flip-flop should be 1. If the output from this flip-flop is 0, the input to this flip-flop is zero. So it is as if this LUT doesn't exist there. It is transparent as far as this, these two flip-flops are concerned. So what values should be stored there? Again, think about it. How the placement of the design affects the maximum clock frequency of the circuit? So you need to first say whether the placement. So placement basically means determining which CLBs should be used for actually in inside the FPGA which physical CLBs should be used for implementing the CLBs after mapping. So you need to tell whether it will affect the clock frequency and if it affects the clock frequency how it will affect so how we should do the placement and routing also okay so that you can get the maximum clock frequency. Okay so again we are coming back to FPGA so let me clarify things once again so FPGAs are integrated circuit okay what they have is thousands and thousands of lookup tables and flip flop and switch boxes and the interconnection between them okay so they are pre manufactured you can implement any digital circuit inside the fpga so basically what you are doing is you are altering the content of the lookup tables you are changing the control bits of the mux and you are changing the configuration of the switch boxes to get your circuit implemented. Okay, so that's why uh, sometimes it seems like uh, any circuit can be implemented in the given FPGA. Okay. Now, why we call it field programmable? Okay, so it is to distinguish it with uh, application-specific ICs. Uh, ASICs, as we mentioned before, their functionality is implemented at the time of manufacturing itself. Once they are manufactured, you cannot change them. But FPGAs, that is not the case. You can change the circuit, or you what effectively you are doing is you are emulating different circuit inside the FPGA by reprogramming it. Okay, so to indicate that they are reprogrammable, their 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 circuit can be changed in the field. Okay, after manufacturing, we call them field programmable. Now, gate arrays, it seems like uh, they have two-dimensional arrays of gate, but you know they don't have two-dimensional array of gate. What they actually have is two-dimensional array of lookup tables or CLBs. Okay? They don't have two-dimensional arrays of gates. But before FPGAs, there were other, other mm, chips called PALs and PLS, programmable array logics and program logic arrays. I don't know, maybe in the digital course you have seen them. They are actually two dimensional arrays of gates, okay? Uh, two dimensional arrays of AND gates and OR gates, and you can implement any combination circuits using PALs and PLS. So, uh, uh, so this gate array is coming from these two types. 
but practically the, uh, there is no gate array, there is an array of CLPs or LUTs. We can implement different circuits in the same FPGA simply by changing the LUT contents and routing logic. We call this FPGA configuration or FPGA programming. Okay, people call it FPGA programming also, it's fine as long as you understand what we mean by FPGA programming. Okay. FPGA programming is basically sending the bit stream to the FPGA and getting it implemented there. Now how do we practically build a circuit into an FPGA? So uh, as you can see it is almost impossible to manually design a large circuit targeting an FPGA. You need to find out the content of hundreds and thousands of lookup tables. You need to find out the configurations of thousands of uh, muxes you need to find the configuration of maybe millions of switch boxes and manually doing it it's impossible so what we do is we we do again some kind of abstraction uh, that is where our hdls are becoming handy actually so using vhdl or weight log again you describe your circuit okay and we use some software tool and these software tools are usually provided by the FPGA vendor. So if we are using Silinx FPGA, we will use a software called Vivado, which is provided by Silinx. If we are using Intel FPGA, we use Quartus, which is provided by Intel. Now these software, they read your code and they interpret your code and they find out how this circuit described by your HDL can be implemented using LUTs, flip-flops, and switch boxes. So here you can see the similarity between uh, IC design and FPGA design. The first stage is exactly same. The front end is exactly same. You describe your uh, hardware using HDL. FPGA tools decide how to implement it using LUTs and flip-flop. IC design software, maybe we used uh, Yosis or there are other tools from um, cadence and synopsis they decide how to implement that circuit using the elements available in the standard library so you see like the similarity they are quite similar so this you are already familiar with with luck so this is the code for a, a two bit adder I have two input a and b and single output c output and you just say c equal to a plus b and the software understands what you are trying to build. You are trying to build an adder, so he finds out how that circuit looks like and how to make that circuit using LUTs. So that's his heading. So, uh, so first step that is called synthesis. Again, you have seen in our IC design. So reading your HDL description and finding out how to implement it using basic elements here, LUTs and flip flop is called synthesis. And again, uh, this I already mentioned, mapping, how to map them to CLPs, that is called mapping. And you need to find where they should be placed inside an FPGA, that is called placement. Then you need to decide how, how these elements should be connected together, that is called routing. And finally, you have so-called bitstream or a configuration file and you send this configuration file to an FPGA through a JTAG interface which we call FPGA configuration or sometimes FPGA programming. Okay. Now the modern FPGAs, the, the content of LUTs and the switch boxes and the MUX, they are stored in SRAM based memory inside the chip. SRAM again we have seen it in the computer architecture course okay they are volatile in nature that means once you remove the power they will lose their content that's why FPGAs also you program the FPGA you operate it once you remove the power the contents of this SRAM memory is lost that means the circuit in implemented inside the FPGA is lost that means next time when you power up you have to basically reprogram it. Why FPGAs are good or bad? Okay, usually FPGAs, they are slower. Their maximum clock frequency is lower than ASIC implementation and they again consume more power compared to ASIC 
protect power consumption again for comparable benchmarks is less than microprocessors and GPUs. Now, why do we use FPGA compared to ASIC? Again, ASIC the the initial cost is very high. Okay, mm, designing and uh, manufacturing a new ASIC it costs several million dollars. But FPGAs, that is not the case. You can just go to market and buy a new chip and just implement your circuit. So for small volumes, if the volumes are a few hundreds to a few thousands, FPGAs make sense. If volume is in terms of millions of chip, FPGAs that don't make sense, you have to go for ASIC. Okay? If ASIC is more co 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 cost effective after 400,000 okay, from this graph. Now, one major advantage of FPGAs is uh, reducing the risk, actually. Again, last semester I mentioned, you build an ASIC, you manufacture it. After manufacturing, if you test it and if your chip doesn't work, most probably that is the end of your company. You you have to go for a respin, and that may cost you again millions of dollars. FPGAs, that is not the case. You program the FPGA, you check whether it is working. You may find out it is not working. Uh, doesn't matter because you can debug it and we will find out how to debug it uh, during runtime also. We will debug it, we will reprogram it and we keep on doing it until the circuit uh, gets working. So the risk is much less for an FPGA based design compared to an ASIC based design because of its reprogrammability. Now, FPGAs can be programmed again and again, so the term is reconfiguration. That's why also FPGA-based uh, computing, we usually call it a reconfigurable computing. So, wherever you hear the term reconfigurable computing, that simply means computing using FPGAs, more or less. There are other chips which are reconfigurable, but more or less in, in every case, we'll be using FPGAs for reconfigurable computing. Okay? And uh, where FPGAs are used? So traditionally, these are the major markets: telecom, defense, aerospace, and automobile. So you can see these are the industries where we we don't have to use millions of chips. And so circuits are usually proprietary, especially for defense and all. We need to make a specific circuit for a specific application. So we won't be uh, manufacturing an ASIC to do it. Instead, we will make it using an FPGA because we need a few thousands of them only. Again, for aerospace satellite application, we are not sending millions of satellites. We are sending a few hundred satellites. So it makes sense to build the circuit using FPGAs rather than designing a new ASIC. And the market share, it's keep on increasing actually. And these are some old statistics. I guess now it is more than $15 billion industry, FPGAs. And uh, these are the job market you can try for FPGA design engineer, RTL design engineer, ASIC front end engineer, because as I mentioned before, the front end is exactly the same for FPGAs and ASIC, and verification testing engineer. And again, some salary statistics. Usually, the salary for an FPGA engineer is more than a software engineer, but the caveat is this includes the salary from Amazon and Google and Facebook all the way to companies which are paying peanuts. So take it with a pinch of salt. But still, usually FPGA research engineers, their salaries are quite high compared to uh, software engineers. 